Good morning and welcome to Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. My name is Kevin. I'm the worship leader for our church community, and I'm really glad that you're joining us for worship today. If you hear some noise in the background today, it could be one of two things causing this seismic rumbling. It's either the construction and the house that's being built right over here on this side of our house, or it's the construction across the house that's being built immediately across the street. I think every piece of construction equipment manageable or imaginable is uh, visiting our neighborhood today. Uh, so that's the rumbling sound. We are continuing our series today, Holy Conversations, and we're talking about commitment. Our connect question is this, what is a commitment that you're really glad that you've made? And I'm certainly glad that I made the commitment to get married. Um, it's been a, a really important part of my life, and it's something that I'm grateful for every day. Also feels like it's the answer that I'm supposed to say, and so I feel like I want to add something else as well, and that's that I'm really glad that I made the commitment to enter the PhD program at Western Michigan. Um, it was just about this time last year when they came to me, uh, some folks from the department there, and said, we want to put your name up for the scholarship. We don't know if you're going to get it, but... If, you're gonna, if we're going to put your name in, we need to have your commitment. We need to know that you will take it if you get it. And so I was put in a position where I had applied for the program. I had wanted to do the program, but suddenly I had to make a very firm commitment and I didn't have very much time to decide. So it's a decision that I'm glad that I made. I've learned a lot and it's really helped me grow in my career and, and also in my writing. So I'm, I'm grateful for that and glad about that. What about you? What are some of the commitments that you're glad that you've made in your life. You can share those with one another. Please use the, the chat bar for that. And we're gonna sing some songs together. Please join with me. Oh, um. 
unshakable, immovable, faithful and true, full of wisdom, strength and beauty. These things are true. down your life, these things are true of you. And as I turn my face to you, O oh Lord, I ask and pray by the power of your love and grace, make these things true of Grace and peace be with you. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm the pastor at Sycamore Creek in Potterville. I'm thrilled you joined us today for our online worship as we conclude our series on Holy Conversations. We've been talking throughout this series about how do we have conversations about the things that matter, including our faith, the things that give us meaning, the things that, that move us toward God, and how do we have those conversations in a way that are compelling to people who might not be followers of Jesus yet. Today we're going to be talking about a really important topic of commitment, uh, but first I'm going to ask you at this time in the worship service to get out a candle and to light that candle as a worship practice, a reminder that God is with us, that our holy conversations focus us on Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. Uh, I have my Christ candle here in Potterville. I invite you to light a candle at home as I light my candle here in Potterville. May the light of that candle remind you that God is with you today, whatever you are going through, whatever you have done, whatever has been done to you, whatever you are wrestling with, God loves you. You are precious in God's sight and God is right here with you. As we remember that truth, will you pray with me? God, we pray today that we might commit ourselves to you. That we pray that as we worship you, as we gather to, to sing and to read scripture and to hear what you might say to us through this community of faith, we pray that we would give ourselves to you. 
give ourselves to you in the midst of whatever we are going through, whatever difficulties we might be experiencing, whatever heartaches we might have, whatever health issues we might be going through. Help us, God, to commit ourselves to you and in turn to share that commitment that we have made to you with others, to tell other people about it, to tell other people about what you mean to us. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love for us. And we offer ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to continue praying with me as we pray the prayer together that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Please join me in that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, as I mentioned, we are wrapping up our series on Holy Conversations. We have a member of our teaching team, David Lalone, who is going to be with us today sharing the message. I'm, I'm excited about the message that David has to give to us about commitment and talking about commitment. But first, here are our hosts for this morning. Good morning. My name is Julie Smith. And my name is Grace. Welcome to the service today. We're your hosts this morning. We encourage you to connect online. The link is down below in the comments. Speaking of the comments, be sure to interact and comment during this message. We also invite you to share the streaming video with your friends. Our message today begins with this. As humans, we're not always the best at making commitments. Have you ever started something that you thought you would commit to and instead you end up quitting? Or have you ever gotten jitters signing your name on a legal document? Or get stuck in, in fear of even making a commitment? I remember when I first started learning how to play the guitar. It was extremely difficult. If you ever pay attention to a guitarist's fret hand, their fingers make some weird and uncomfortable looking shapes. While that hand is making weird shapes, the other hand has the job of strumming a particular way and rhythm. Now I have been playing guitar now for over a dozen years, but I distinctly remember questioning my commitment. Why was I putting myself through these agonizing practices? My fingers hurt and I sounded awful. I thought to myself, what am I doing this for? I almost quit until one day, I was walking home from work and I was singing this song this was not an uncommon occurrence, but I realized halfway home that this was not some song I heard on the radio or something. I was writing a song and I didn't even know it. I kept singing this song over and over again until I got home where I could quickly write it down and start writing the music for my first song. It was right there that I was able to answer the why question. I was learning to play guitar so that I could write music. Being a musician comes with its own struggles and I have considered quitting many times, but my brain won't seem to stop writing songs. I committed to something, and really, I committed to myself to see what would come from this whole music thing. There is risk and struggle and commitment, but there is also much curiosity for what lies ahead. So that leads us to our first chat question. When have you been apprehensive of making a commitment?
The Gospels all start with Jesus, though they each start the story in a different way. The Gospels also tell us about 12 disciples. We don't get to read an in-depth story of each of these 12 individuals. Though Dallas Jenkins' hit show, The Chosen, is doing a wonderful job of imagining these characters. Ultimately, the Gospel is about Jesus. Though the disciples don't get a ton of press, these 12 persons each make a revolutionary commitment to follow Jesus. Did Jesus have his disciples sign a contract? Well, not really, but that doesn't make their steps of faith any less significant. How does a person become a follower of Jesus? This question could be answered with practical steps, much like the steps to become a member of an organization. We have heard the steps to take, the boxes to check, if you will, in order to become a follower of Jesus. Pray the sinner's prayer, confess your sins, repent, confess your faith, be baptized, go to church, read your Bible, pray, tithe, and serve the Lord. If you ever question your commitment, start the list over again, rinse and repeat. This is quite silly though, right? Though these elements are important, they are not a checklist. Following Jesus is less like joining a religion and more like starting a relationship or starting a conversation. Through this series, we have been exploring how we talk about our faith. We have been talking about holy conversations. The problem is we don't really feel comfortable talking about our faith, at least not outside the normal church walls. It's not that we don't like to talk about it. Sometimes we just don't know how. I hope this series has been helpful in stepping out of your comfort zone and practicing some holy conversations. So how do we start a relationship with Jesus? Starting a relationship can be such an organic process that you may not even think about it, how to do it. Other times, starting a relationship can be much more intentional. It seems so easy making friends when you're a kid. It gets a little harder as an adult. But God is so much more than a friend, even though Jesus called his disciples friends shortly before his death. Encountering Jesus is much different than meeting someone at a party and starting up a chat. And yet, we long for a relationship with God. The first problem is that Jesus ascended to heaven a long time ago, and we are actually awaiting his return. The lack of his physical presence in the typical way we think of makes it difficult to start a relationship. Getting past the physical problem, we have to start with the desire to have a relationship with Jesus. What attracts a person to Jesus? The beautiful thing is that God is the one that initiates the relationship. I remember a couple occasions of, of persons who are now my close friends pursuing me. My friend Fish called me on the phone and asked me if I wanted to go see an REO Speedwagon concert. Of course, I said yes. And we have been friends ever since. And my friend Sean sat next to me in class one day in college and started drawing these cartoons of me with large muscles and ridiculously long hair. God never called me up to take me to a concert or draw funny cartoons on me. Actually, God pursued me in much more powerful and subtle ways as well. God has shown up in what can only be explained as miracles, and God has been that source of comfort in dark moments. That leads us to our next chat question. When did someone else, God, or another person initiate a relationship with you?
What does this relationship look like? In the previous episode, we talked about believing. Sometimes we forget that there is so much more to our faith than what we believe. In the beginning of this relationship with Jesus, we are transformed from within. Our beliefs go through a process of transformation. You can call this a change of the head. Jesus can also transform our relationships and emotions. We can call this a heart change. We start to trust Jesus more and more. This, this leads us to make that commitment, where our behavior changes to where we become a better person. Like I said before, we as humans have anxiety about commitment. It requires something of us. You could say it costs us something. Jesus used a variety of metaphors to describe commitment. Jesus told his disciples to carry their cross. Jesus told them to abide in him. There's another metaphor that Jesus used that I find really fascinating, marriage. Marriage is a great metaphor for talking about commitment to God, not only because it's biblical, but because it's one of the biggest relational commitments one can make. As humans, we are prone to falling short of the beautiful ideals God has for us. Maybe you have experienced a toxic or abusive marriage. I hope that the marriage metaphor isn't triggering in any way. The Bible speaks of Jesus being the bridegroom and the church is the bride. When you commit to following Jesus and the mission of the church, you are joining into this covenant relationship. But it's rare that anyone gets married to someone after knowing them for only a day. Well, maybe it's more common in Las Vegas. The point is that marriage is not a quick decision. Committing to this whole born-again Christian life is no different. There's a period of getting to know what this is all about. There's a typically a period of courting or engagement before the wedding. The more we get to know Jesus, we begin to engage more with his teaching and enjoy the fullness of life that he offers. Every marriage has a ceremony. If it's in front of a court judge or in front of a church and family, marriage ceremonies are full of great meaningful symbols and traditions. Probably most important are the marriage vows. These are the words that both persons profess to one another, to the church, and to God. My wife Star and I decided to write our own vows on top of the traditional vows. Another ritual that we included in our wedding was having our wedding party pray over us. And Star and I also got married at a golf course. So for our unity ceremony, we decided to hit a golf ball into the pond. The ball actually came up just shy of the pond. Star was content in leaving it put, but I decided to run and grab the ball and chuck it into the pond myself. These were all ways of celebrating and confirming our commitment as a couple. Commitment as a Christian has an equally beautiful ceremony. It's called baptism. Baptism is more than just getting dunked into water or sprinkled with water. It is so much more than that. I could give a whole message on baptism. It is full of symbolism that expresses the beauty of being born again and joining into the body of Christ, the church. In baptism, it is customary for the one being baptized to profess their faith through a set of agreed beliefs and commitments to the mission of the church. God is constantly at work in the life of the church as the Spirit of God leads His people in, his, in its mission. Commitment is not about having it all together. It is about staying in love with God. It's about staying committed to the relationship, the covenant. Even the image of being born again can be looked at as a process. It does usually take around nine months for a baby to come to full term and be born. Every relationship involves some work. Marriage is no different. It is actually one of the hardest relationships you will ever experience. It's not always easy. And the name God gives the nation of Israel actually means to struggle or wrestle. Committing and working on relationships can be a struggle. As God engages with us, it is normal to wrestle with Him. It is normal to struggle to commit. And that leads us to this question. When have you wrestled with God?
So how do we talk about commitment? In this series, we are trying to learn and hopefully practice how to have holy conversations. This may feel like a task of trying to squeeze theology or a little bit of Jesus into everyday conversations. This is not what we are trying to teach. It's actually something much more organic, but still very intentional. We naturally talk about things that are interesting to us. Conversation is about sharing something of value. The gospel means good news. The gospel can be the salt that flavors our conversations. This idea is what the Christian word evangelism is all about. This term evangelism has been misused and abused. It has been shrunk down into a formula. Evangelism is much more personal and should be less stressful. It should be more of a conversation. Talking about commitment can start with sharing your story. Have you told anyone recently about when you started to really commit your life to Jesus? For many, this is the story of your baptism. If it wasn't your baptism, I imagine it was some other ritual or rite of passage that publicly announced your commitment to Jesus. I imagine there are so many other stories you could share throughout your faith story. Some of you may have gone overseas on a mission trip, or maybe you volunteer and serve in a local mission. Talking about commitment is not about bragging about what you have done, but about sharing what God has done in you. Richard Peace in his book, Holy Conversation, gives us some rules to help guide us to have better conversations. The first rule is be kind and generous. If our conversations are not full of kindness, then they're not holy. The second one is enjoy the dialogue. Conversations are meant to be enjoyable. Whoever said evangelism wasn't fun? And next, expect differing views. If you go into a conversation expecting that the other person may have a different view on something than you, you are more likely to be prepared for how to handle it. Hint, be kind. Next, be clear in what you say. We often think we are communicating well. Talking about faith, we can often rely on churchy words and ambiguity. Think before you speak and speak in a way that the other person will understand what you are saying. And be honest. We can be tempted to oversell our faith. Reminder, we're not selling Jesus and it is not our responsibility to save others. The Holy Spirit does that work. We are interested in sharing the good news through our authentic experience. So be yourself and be honest. And don't manipulate. We can also be tempted to manipulate in many ways. This can be subtle or overt. Remember, this is a conversation. You aren't required to close a deal. Just let the conversation happen and be in prayer throughout the experience. Now following these rules gives you a good framework, but what do we actually talk about? If you are listening to this message, you may be worshiping with Sycamore Creek for the first time, or maybe you've been with us for a while, and maybe you're a partner of Sycamore Creek. I love that Sycamore Creek uses the term partnership instead of membership. To become a partner of the church is to join into the mission of the church. As a partner, you are actively working toward the mission in some way. There's always something happening within the life of the church, and therefore there's a lot to talk about. Commitment looks like joining a small group that prays with one another. Commitment looks like serving in some capacity. I've recently been able to serve the community in a new capacity. I'm the treasurer for a new nonprofit, Jubilee, that is working to eradicate homelessness in the Lansing area through addressing relational poverty. We are working to create a network of mentors to support individuals and families as they transition into permanent supportive housing. We hope to eventually have a residential properties that we can provide long-term care for those in need. This has been a joy to serve in this new way. If you have questions about Jubilee, I would love to have a holy conversation about it. You see right there, I took an opportunity to invite others into something I'm already doing. What are you already doing that you could invite others into? Again, this isn't an opportunity to brag. Rather, it's an opportunity to share your passion and joy of serving. For example, if you've ever served in, an, in our annual gas giveaway, who wouldn't want to hear about that? It may feel awkward or strange at first, but it's something that with just a little practice, it will become easier and easier. Remember my story of learning to play the guitar? It took a lot of practice and I sounded awful for a while, but eventually I was able to play a beautiful song. I hope that you all are able to have beautiful conversations with people 
that are unchurched are those that feel estranged from God. We often get consumed by what we have to say in a conversation. My favorite way to start a good conversation is to ask a question and then wait. The first step of this is coming up with a good question. The key is to have something you are genuinely interested in and are genuinely interested in what the other person has to say about it. Then the waiting part comes. This is the part that you listen. I know this is really hard for some people, but trust me, it's the best part. For me, it's the time that I can quiet my brain and hang on to their every word. Everybody has something to say about God. We are all untrained theologians. We all have questions. We all have experiences. And we often can get tripped up into not feeling confident in our knowledge of God and the Bible. And I think such knowledge can be, make things easier, but we each know a lot about what God has done in our own lives. So don't get tripped up on what you don't know and focus on the good news of what God has done in your life for the world. I hope that in this series you have begun to make steps toward holy conversations. Maybe you've intentionally sat down and had coffee with someone. Or maybe you have picked up your phone and called someone. You know, use that phone app on your phone. If you are not ready to practice a holy conversation with someone, maybe you can commit to just reading the book by Richard Peace, Holy Conversation. You can pick up a copy in our micro bookstore. This leads us to our next chat question. How did God pursue you? And what has kept you committed to following Jesus? Something has happened within the, the American church landscape in the past few decades. People have been leaving the church. This is often looked at in completely negative light. But I think it is an opportunity for good conversation. You may know someone that has left the church. Though it can often be a painful experience, I would challenge you to ask them why. Be careful in how you ask though. You could say to them, I'm curious to hear about your church experience and what led you to walk away. You see, they have a story of commitment gone wrong. To use the marriage metaphor again, they have gone through a divorce with the church and maybe even God. And this is not a time to try to pull them back to the church too quickly. We as Christians are quick to say, our church isn't like that. But just like a divorcee isn't likely to jump back into marriage, someone that left the church isn't going to jump back into the pew. This is a time to understand their experience and when appropriate, share your experience. A follow-up question you could ask is, what do you miss about church and your commitment to following Jesus? There are other questions you can ask to start a conversation as well. We all have had life-changing events that have transformed us. So ask them, what event or person has transformed you? We've all had big decisions that required commitment. Ask them, what has been your biggest commitment you have had to make? Now we all like to talk, some more than others. 
The time to talk is in sharing your story, because we all have a story. You can share a time when you have struggled. You can share a time when you felt so close to God. And when have you felt distant from God? How did you get through that? I imagine there is someone close to you that could benefit from your story. I've been having an ongoing conversation with a good friend of mine about faith. We went to Christian college together, but it's been a long time since he has been a part of a local church body. He struggles with commitment and the messiness that comes in being a member within a church. He misses the warmth that comes with being in a Christian community, but he wrestles with the baggage and the barriers that exist. He has been stuck in that search for the perfect church that he knows doesn't exist. These conversations can last several minutes or a couple hours. For him, I am one of the only few people he can really talk about his struggles in faith. A lot of the time, I try to give him time to talk and process, but I also have room to speak truth into his life. I challenge him to follow through in his commitment as a follower of Jesus. Remember those disciples I was talking about earlier? Guess what? They had to learn how to have holy conversations too. They were excited to share about being disciples of Jesus. They took on the role of discipling others. This process starts with a conversation. I have had the joy of being discipled by others and discipling others myself. I am continually surprised by what others have to say and how my own story and perspectives has an effect on others. I want to take this time to pray for you and your holy conversations. God, you are holy, and you have also set us apart as a peculiar people. May you lead us to connect with those around us and lead us into good conversations. As we commit to this relationship with you, may we see the relationships we have with others in a new light. May you give us a heart for evangelism. Lord, have mercy on us as we struggle to listen and as we struggle to speak. May we remember that you are there with us in the midst of our conversations. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Thank you, David. I have a couple of brief announcements for us. The first brief announcement is that we would love to help you get connected. We'd love to have you take next steps that help you to grow in your faith. You can do that by filling out a digital connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connection. Now you'll see that each week there, there, there are unique next steps that you can take to help you to grow in your faith. If you fill out that digital connection card for the first time, we have a book that we'd like to send you as a gift. It's by Max Lucado called You'll Get Through This. We'll send that right from Amazon to your house. We have a couple exciting things coming up this week. On Tuesday, we have our gas giveaway from 5.30 to 6.30 at Frank's BP here in Potterville. I'm super excited about that. And then the following night on Wednesday, we have our Ash Wednesday Humbling and Healing Service. That'll be at 7 p.m. It's available both online, uh, just the way you're watching uh, worship right now and engaging with worship. It'll also be in person at our South Lansing campus of Sycamore Creek Church. Coming up as well in the month of March, we are going to be doing our first generosity drive. This is going to be a a new annual thing that we are going to do at Sycamore Creek to help us all to grow in our generosity, both with our finances and with our time. You'll be hearing more about that in the upcoming weeks. Uh, You should be getting letters in the mail soon about that. And uh, that will culminate in a, a generosity Sunday on March 20th, uh, where we will ask you to, to give in a card where you commit to how generous you will be in this upcoming year. Uh, I just want to make you aware of that and, and remind you of how important generosity is. Uh, speaking of generosity, I want to thank you for your giving to support the mission of Sycamore Creek Church. We can't accomplish all the things we accomplish without your generous giving. But generosity is more than that. Generosity changes you. And over the next several weeks, you're going to be hearing some testimonies from people sharing how generosity has impacted their lives, how giving to Sycamore Creek has impacted their lives, and how they see the impact of their giving spread out to people around them. Thank you for giving to support the mission of Sycamore Creek.
Speaking of the mission of Sycamore Creek, one of the exciting things that we have that, that we are beginning to, to get into is we're going to move forward with the adoption of Asbury United Methodist Church. If you haven't heard about this yet, I'm really excited. Sycamore Creek is a church that is committed to reaching into new mission fields, to reaching new people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we are excited about the adoption of Asbury United Methodist moving forward, which will allow us to reach people, new people, with the good news of Jesus Christ in the area around Eastwood Town Center. I would invite you to continue to pray for Sycamore Creek, to pray for Asbury United Methodist as we move forward with that adoption. And may we continue to follow God as we are on God's mission to share God's love with our communities and with the people around us. Here is Kevin with our final worship song. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Oh, oh, oh. oh. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you. High above my life, I will trust in you alone, you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. When you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. Keep this life I lose, I'll follow. Light unto the world, light unto my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I see, knowing I will find all I need in you alone. You alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. life I lose, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah. In you there's life everlasting, in you there's freedom for my soul, in you there's joy unending. I will follow whom you love, I love how you serve, I'll serve in this life I lose. I will follow you, yeah. I will follow you, yeah. I will follow you, yeah. I will follow. Have a great week. Go in peace. Hope to see you again soon.